20, and you can find your handout, the little yellow sheet you were given on your way in, and on the back of all of our announcements is today's outline. You can go left to right, column to column, as we fill in some blanks on this Easter Sunday. Wanted. Everybody wanted something on that day. No one was neutral about Jesus on that first day of the week. They either wanted him to be dead or they very much wanted him to be alive, but no one was neutral. Everybody wanted something. Even after he arose from the dead, all the leaders of the land had to do, think about this, all those wicked people in charge had to do in order to squelch Christianity forever was to produce a body. Just show everyone the dead body since you insist that he's dead. But they couldn't do that. They tipped their hand. They revealed that they knew that he was alive and that they wanted him to be dead. You can't be neutral about Jesus, folks. No one here, no one watching this recording can be neutral either. You either believe or you don't, right, church? You either are saved or you are not. You are his follower or you aren't. You're a part of his church or you are not. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. You can't be neutral about Jesus Christ. And six months prior to Jesus going to the cross, he began to predict that it would happen to him, that he would be killed and that he would rise again. In Matthew 16 and verse 21, Jesus began to show his disciples how he would go to Jerusalem and suffer and look at the screen here, be killed and be raised again the third day. Did you know a total of five times, five times he told his disciples that he would be crucified and be buried and would come back to life? He even told his disciples one of those times where to meet him after the resurrection. Well, ironically, after he was dead and buried, the Pharisees remembered everything that he said about coming back to life. And his own followers seemed to forget. <laughs> the ones who wanted him dead were just sure that he was alive. <laughs> And those that would want so much for him to be alive just knew he's dead. The Old Testament had predicted the resurrection even before Jesus did. Psalm 1610 on the screen, thou wilt not suffer thine holy one, that's Jesus, to see corruption. Corruption meaning decay, decomposition. Psalm 2, 2 is interesting to me. It says that the kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's Jesus. He that sitteth in the heavens, that's God the Father, shall what? Laugh. Let me ask you, what's God laughing about? <laughs> it's because he knows this is not the end of the story. God knew that in killing his son, they were simply lighting the fuse of a powder keg that was about to explode with resurrection power. Dunamis, dynamite resurrection power. Following the crucifixion, hell rejoiced for three days, and meanwhile, God the Father just laughed. Pilate and Herod patted each other on the back and laughed and congratulated each other on a plan well executed, a man well executed. The religious leaders laughed and said, well, that's the end of that. Oh, but they didn't have the last laugh, did they? No. Nietzsche proclaimed, God is dead. Many others trying to kill God today. Now, on the flip side, some believers say they believe that he's alive, but then don't live like it, which is worse. 
Nobody's laughing at this moment. But what a picture it must have been. The rock of ages sealed behind an aging rock. The light of the world right now shut up in darkness. The one who came to give life is now dead, but not for long. That's why I don't care for the crucifix, you know, a cross that has Jesus there. He's no longer on that cross. We serve a risen Savior. Can I have an amen today? A risen Savior he is. Gospel means good news, and it would not be good news if he had only died and not come back to life. Oh, I'm happy to remind you today, church, that although almost everyone thought it was all over, including his disciples, Jesus shouted triumphantly, Over my dead body, and up from the grave he arose, conquering death, hell, and the grave. This is the truth of Easter. But let's digress a moment. Our title today indicates that though many wanted him to be alive, many more wanted him to be dead. And so let's survey the evidence today in a courtroom style. CSI's got nothing on the drama of what happens here in this story. Let's do a cross-examination today of the evidence. You'll have to write fast. The conspiracy is first. It all started with a conspiracy against Jesus. And indeed, there is a movement still this day to rid the world of Jesus. People who detest our Judeo-Christian heritage. Terrorists who want to kill Jews and Christians in the name of their God. Americans who don't want there to be a God. Many Americans would love for all the Christians in this nation to just disappear. And I got news for them. One day, they're going to get their wish. The conspiracy. Secondly, in the second column there, you see the accomplice. Satan has many willing to sell him their souls, just like Judas, who was the accomplice to the death of Jesus Christ. And like Judas, all who are willing to sell their souls will spend an eternity regretting it. Thirdly, notice the deliberations. Early deliberations. Sequestered away in an upper room, there are some deliberations happening. Look at the screen, please. In Luke twenty-two twenty-four, 24, it says that the disciples were arguing. When important things are going on, when eternity hangs in the balance, it says there was a strife among them, which of them would be considered the greatest. The disciples are a picture of us, however. Isn't it just like Christians to squabble over trivial things when major things are going on? Well, their discussion in that upper room, these deliberations came to an abrupt halt as Jesus began to wash their stinking feet, proving forever who is truly the greatest. Well, we need to establish motive next. Motive. John 15, 13 clears that up. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. If you're one of Jesus' friends and he died for you, would you say hallelujah today? Hallelujah. He laid down his life for his friends. It was love. Was it premeditated? That's our next point. Was it premeditated? Luke twenty two forty four says he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat were, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. That's the medical condition, hemothydrosis, where the capillaries in the forehead can literally burst under extreme stress and duress, thinking of the sins of the world that he's going to die for. Oh, this was premeditated. <laughs> This wasn't a whim. Jesus had thought it out very carefully and completely from the time his father sent him to save us. It was clear what he had to do. Every lamb in the Old Testament that was sacrificed, Jesus as God would see that happen and he knew what he had to do. 
Even in the Garden of Eden, when man fell, he knew what he had to do. God was speaking to Satan in Genesis 3.15 on the screen when he said to Satan, I'll put enmity, that is a great division, between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Then he says this to Satan, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Yes, you will succeed in crucifying Jesus Christ, bruising his heel. But in so doing, you'll be sealing your own fate as that very heel stamps your head. Look at it again. It shall bruise thy head as thou bruise his heel. And Jesus knew what he had to do. And here we are in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it all culminates. What has been on our Savior's mind from eternity past is now coming to pass. And so without reservation and no him hawing around, ladies and gentlemen, I can report today that the deed that Christ is about to do was as premeditated as any has ever been. And in meditation, he thought of you, your face, your name, and mine. Let's go to our opening statement, shall we? What was Jesus' defense? He was allowed to make an opening statement. And what did he say? Let me tell you. Nothing. He didn't defend himself, as we humans are so apt to do. He remained silent in his own defense. They call prosecution witnesses against him. They bribe false witnesses. Jesus was allowed to call witnesses. He could have called multitudes. He did not call anyone to his defense. And then one who should have known to defend him recuses himself. That's the next, the recusal. Peter denies the Lord cowering in the shadows as other disciples did. Jesus said before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. And, G and Peter did deny him three times. And then the cock crowed. And what a poignant moment it must have been as the Bible indicates in one of the gospel, from one of the gospel writers, that from a distance, his eyes and Jesus' eyes met And we are reminded today that we are supposed to take a stand, a witness called to the stand. Don't recuse yourself. Next, Jesus faces the interrogation. The interrogation and his meekness is incomprehensible, unimaginable. It can't be put into words. We've already said how he did not defend himself, did not call witnesses, and no one came to his rescue. Isaiah 53, 7 says he was oppressed, afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Brought as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And it gives evidence that he wanted to die. He wanted to die for us. He's different. Well, this kangaroo court seems to result in a hung jury. The hung jury. In any other courtroom, he would have been set free. And yet, what do they pronounce as judgment? Guilty. And the death penalty is called for. I object, said Pilate. The objection. A weak stand he took, however. What was he objecting to? himself getting in any kind of trouble. He washed his hands. He was looking out for himself. What a weakling. And next we see a diversion. A diversion tactic is used. You see, it was in the Jewish economy, it was something that they often did to release someone who was guilty. It was part of their tradition. Let's take someone who's guilty 
and release them. So Pilate says, who should we release? Assuming they would choose Jesus. And they say, Barabbas? Release Barabbas, this murdering thief? That just doesn't seem fair. You've got Barabbas standing here and Jesus standing here. Which of these should we let free this Passover? Oh, let's release Barabbas. That's not fair. But let's never forget that Barabbas is you and me. We who are guilty, set free. An innocent man takes our place and bears our guilt. Next are some blood tests. Jot it down, please. Blood tests. DNA analysis, if you will, reveals that Jesus is God. We've got a doctor in the house. Who does the blood come from, the mother or the father? It comes from the father, the DNA of him being God. Lab results, write it down. Toxin of sin is found. What? This is Jesus. This is God. And the toxin of sin is found in his body? Yes, look at the screen, please. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. He who knew no sin. 1 Peter 2.24 He his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree. And yet just before the cross, there's no trace of sin in him. 1 Peter 2.22 Who did no sin. Did no sin. Hebrews 4.15 He was tempted like we are yet without sin. And so the toxin of sin is found in our lab results. But it's not his sin. Something else found. You know what it is? Saliva. You watch these crime shows? They found saliva there, but it was not Jesus' saliva. Evil men having fun with a near dead man on a cross and Jesus bore it all as they spit upon him. So the lab results show the toxin of sin, the saliva, and something else. And here you got to wonder, with this third item, is there some evidence tampering? Some of the blood samples gathered at the foot of the cross aren't quite right, perhaps. Maybe somebody planted this evidence. There's another liquid at the foot of the cross we find in our pathology, and what is it? It's water. It's water poured out when the spear went through his side. Deep in the heart of this thirsty, dried up body of Christ is a little bit of water left, and it too is poured out in the final step of this crucifixion. And it reminds us, folks, of John 4.14, where he said, Whosoever drinketh the water I shall give shall never thirst. John 7.38, rivers of living water you will receive. Outpoured blood and water, the blood for salvation, the water for sanctification. Make no mistake about it. The lab results show us amazing things as well. Well, it only gets more interesting at this point. In this cross-examination, we find footprints. A lot of footprints. Some found in Mary and Joseph's home. They were little. Some in the temple from a young age. Some footprints leading in and out of the River Jordan. Leading up to the top of the Mount of Olives where he preached. Leading into cemeteries where he healed and cast out demons. Footprints at Lazarus' tomb. Look this way, please. One set leading in, two sets leading out. The footprints of Jesus found in slums and alleys of the poor. At the well where a Samaritan stood. In homes of lepers and tax collectors. And get this, 
on the Sea of Galilee. Prince from only a week before the cross found along a narrow street in Jerusalem with the imprints of palm branches. And then along an incline a week later, just outside the city to that jagged hill that looks like a skull. Footprints. Fingerprints. Fingerprints of Jesus found everywhere except not on any swords, not on any weapons of any kind. But they sure were found on people's eyes and ears and legs and many shoulders. Some of whom had leprosy when he touched them. Like who would touch them? Jesus' fingerprints found on the cheeks and hands of many children. On some leftover bread and fish on a hillside in a basket. On sails, tables in the temple. Truly amazing to me is the fact of how his prints could be found in some sand where that adulterous woman nearly got stoned. And on his disciples' feet. And on Malchus's ear. Wow. For sure the clearest prints of Jesus were found on the cross as if he were clinging to it. Footprints, fingerprints. There's a little bit of ballistic work we can do. Ballistics, other items at the scene. Woven thorns found there. You know, back in the Garden of Eden, thorns became part of the curse. And Jesus had never experienced the consequences of sin since he did not sin. He had not experienced the consequences of sin until those thorns were driven into his scalp. Spikes are among the ballistics. Three of them needed to fasten what? What was fastened to the cross? Well, those three spikes fastened a hand and a hand and the feet, right? And something else, a list, a large list fastened into the wood. What? Colossians 2, starting in verse 13, having forgiven you all trespasses, what's the next verse? Verse 14, blotting out that handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, this list of your sins and mine, nailed to the cross among the ballistics. He could have stopped the soldier's mallet in mid-swing from driving those nails, but he wanted that list fastened there. Along with a sign above. You remember John 19, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, saying, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. They said, no, say that he said, I'm the King of the Jews. And in fulfillment of prophecy, Pilate said, I wrote what I wrote, saying he is the king of the Jews. All four Gospels mention it. Its truth could not be crossed out. And it was put there in all the languages of all the peoples who were gathered there that day. The fact of who this was. Love in any language. Read between the nails. I love you. Written in red. Here's your sign. Among the ballistics, we find a robe, a bloody garment laid aside unnoticed after being gambled for, a robe of Christ's righteousness taken off of him and replaced with the wardrobe of indignity, stripped naked in public shame before everyone, including his own mother. He exchanged robes. He exchanged robes with me and with you. 
Man has been given his robe of righteousness in exchange for our old, tattered garments of sin. Now listen. God wants you at the marriage supper of the Lamb one day. He wants you to be there with him in his kingdom. And I want you to know it's a formal occasion. You're not allowed in without this particular dinner jacket, this white robe given you in trade for your filthy rags. On the scene also found a sponge, a sponge. One gospel writer who was there at the scene testifies of a thirsty Messiah. He hasn't had anything to drink since the night before. He's lost most of what liquid was in his body. His wind-blown lips are dried and cracked, his mouth of cotton. He couldn't swallow. He could scarcely speak through his hoarse throat. And so they offered him a drink. And this drink contained sedative properties, which would have numbed his pain and relieved his thirst. But Jesus turned it away. He chose to feel the full force of his sufferings. He was dying for everything on that list fastened to that cross. Now let's examine just a few numbers before we're done today. The number of public religious leaders who believed that he truly was the Messiah? Zero. The type of people who did believe that he was the Messiah? Stargazers, night shift shepherds, some newlyweds who claim to have more experience giving birth than experience in bed. <laughs> How many disciples were there in total? About 70 at this time. How many of them defended him to the end? <laughs> Zero. The number of lepers and sick that Jesus healed, too many to count. How many of them defended him? Zero. The number of times that Jesus had prophesied that he would rise again? Five. The number of the disciples who heard him? All of them. The number of apostles who waited at the tomb to see? Zero. What are the odds that a street corner bookie would have given the day after the crucifixion that we would know Jesus' name today in the 21st century? They would have said, I'll give you better odds that he'll rise from the dead than that. And so now we go down into the morgue, a borrowed tomb. He only needed it for the weekend. Grave clothes. We don't like to think about them. Nobody talks about grave clothes at dinner parties. What do you want to be buried in? Something to die for. No. We're in the morgue. We're looking at these grave clothes. And what's going on behind the scenes? Surveillance. Surveillance. The drama continues. Remember that the chief priests and the Pharisees and Pilate said, command that that sepulcher be made sure, seal it up tight. Why? They said, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. <coughs> Surveillance they put it under. Get this, armed guards to prevent a dead man from leaving. <laughs> a seal placed upon it. They would stretch a string across and seal it with wax on both sides and the king's signet would stamp it in there. You would know if that string had come loose. Now a good investigator at this juncture will sense that there's fear in these leaders. The Jewish leaders, the Romans, they are shaken in their boots. There's fear in their bones because they were shaken by the earthquake that happened on the cross. They saw everything in the middle of the day go dark. 
they heard about the veil being torn from top to bottom, that thick veil. They knew that there were otherworldly forces at work. But the authorities were mostly afraid of the disciples moving Jesus. <laughs> They're afraid the disciples are going to move Jesus. You know who moved? God moved. God's hand, the hand that moves the world. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon him, sat upon that stone. And it says, for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. <laughs> He's come back to life. They like die in their place. And Luke 24 says, on the first day of the week, they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. Write it down. Nobody Nobody's there. No bodies there. They entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And two men stood by in shining garments saying, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Why are you coming to a graveyard looking for the living Jesus? He's not here. He's risen. Then he said this, Remember how he spake to you? And they then remembered his words. And so begins the cover up. The cover up. It says, when they were going, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests the things that were done, and they gave large money, it says, unto the soldiers. They bribed the soldiers and said, Say that his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept, and we'll make sure that the governor doesn't take your head for it. And they took the bribe money and did as they were told. Are you still listening? Say amen. amen. Get this. Those soldiers believed in the resurrection. <laughs> Obviously, these religious leaders believed in the resurrection since they tried to cover it up. And some of them not only believed in the resurrection, some of them believed on the resurrection and were born again. Acts 6-7 says that the word of God increased, the number of disciples multitude, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. These religious leaders who had him killed said, I'm changing teams. I'm switching sides. I believe, just as one of those centurions said at the foot of the cross. Just as one of those thieves said on another cross. Yes, there's always going to be some wicked who don't believe. And in every crowd, there's somebody who's going to believe. Though there's a cover-up. We're almost done. Eyewitnesses. Were there eyewitnesses? The Bible says over 500. And some of those wrote about it in their own history books. You can go outside the Bible and see writings of Josephus and others, contemporaries of Jesus, who say, I saw him. He was alive. Eyewitnesses. Now, before we're done, we must finish by establishing intent. Like you do in a courtroom. What was his intent? Well, first of all, remember, when Jesus died, so did your sin. That was his intent. When he rose, so did your hope. That was his intent. As we close this service, I want you to focus on these verses I show you now. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life. Would you say that M word with me, please? Might have life. And that they might have it more abundantly. That was his intent, that you might have life. John 5.40, he said, Ye will not come to me that ye might have life. He said to a group that was trying to kill him. John 20 and verse 31, our text today. These things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing ye might have life through his name. Look this way, please. Will you go to heaven when you die? I have the answer. You might. If you've been born again, you will. 
but you certainly can. When I am dead, I will suddenly be alive. Will you? You might be. You can be. Do you know that you will be? Let's close our eyes and bow our heads.